this morning. If you would, turn with me to Luke chapter 15. Today we're going to look at how our Heavenly Father sees us when we're lost. Um, when we wander, there's only a couple of ways to be lost, and there's no middle ground. Either we're his and we've strayed off into the thicket, or we ultimately are going to be permanently lost. Um, not even those counted among the flock. So from our perspective, we can't know who will be adopted into the fold, right? We can't know the intricate and eternal mechanics of that, but we know that for his, there's a call. His sheep hear his voice, and we respond, but that's, that's another lesson for another day. Today's Father's Day. Um, it's a 20th, 20th century tradition. And it sells a lot of greeting cards, a lot of neckties, coffee mugs, fishing lures. I don't know what else. So having sat through decades of Mother's Day and Father's Day sermons, I've noticed some interesting anomalies. And Jason and I were talking about this earlier as, as well. Um, sensitive pastors will typically preach glowing messages for moms meant to encourage and extol the virtues of motherhood and so forth. And um, then there's the breakfast and there's, or there's the lunch, going to the restaurants to your mom's favorite establishment. On the other hand, for Father's Day, Father's Day sermons aren't usually so glowing. Um, more often than not, they're a little bit more critical and heavy-handed. Because pa pastors, probably because they are fathers themselves, typically wish to impress what they often see lacking in today's men. And perhaps even themselves. So rather than, rather than taking to a nice lunch or whatever, they'll also find themselves grilling and taking care of their own lunches. And that's just the way it is, ostensibly because they like their, their own barbecuing a lot more than what they find in local restaurants and waiting in lines and so forth. So all this to say that we already know that there's no Father's Day in the Bible. Um, but we can learn within the Bible's pages what makes our Heavenly Father's day, um, and a bit of what does not. So as we look at Luke chapter 15, Luke 15, it describes some Pharisees doing what Pharisees do, looking to trap Jesus, trying to bait him, and trying to, uh, trying to look for Areas of criticism that they can go back and tell their buddies. Let's take a look and see what's going on here in um, Luke. This is typically, this is known as the um, a parable that, well, three different parables in here. There's the parable of the prodigal son is what it's known as. I've kind of called it the parable of the lost sons. It's also sometimes you can call it the parable of the lost sheep. And there's also people will break it up and call it also the parable of the lost drachma, the parable of the lost sons, or the parable of... So there's different ones. But let's look at the passage and see what's going on because that's what's important. Verse 1, now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near him to listen to him. And both the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So when he says that he's grumbling, it means it's a great, a great murmuring. So there was a great murmuring among the scribes and the Pharisees. 
So he told them this parable saying, so it's one parable, even though there's three different kind of stories in here, it's all the same message. It's all the same theme. And that's what we want to take a look at. So these three parables go together. They really are a whole. It's really just one parable. In verse 4, what man among you, if he has 100 sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. So Jesus illustrates by telling us about the owner of these lost sheep. Now, this isn't a caretaker. This is the owner himself and his sheep. We've seen elsewhere stories in the Bible about the one caring for the sheep. The shepherd, sometimes if a wolf comes, they might leave and head out of town because they're in danger. This is an entirely different type of a story. This is the owner of the sheep, and this is going to be a common theme. So I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And this is something to ponder. Obviously, this is hyperbole saying not that they don't need to repent, but they don't recognize within within themselves the need for repentance, right? In uh, verses 8 to 10, he uses an example of a woman who lost one of 10 significant coins. And then finally, in the remainder of the chapter, we see what has become famously known as the parable of the prodigal son, where a father finds he's lost one of his two sons. So note again that in all of these, in each of these cases, ownership remains the constant theme in the passage. So look at verse 4. Let's read that again. What man among you, if he has 100 sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found the sheep which I lost. So it's 1%. He's lost 1% of what he owns. Notice what he's addressing here to the scribes and Pharisees. While they're grumbling because Jesus is hanging out with sinners and tax collectors, He is imparting to them knowledge on how the Heavenly Father looks at sinners. So the self-righteous, the self-righteous think they're right. They think they are sinless. That's why they're self-righteous, right? They examine themselves by themselves um, and compared to those who are around them who seem to be worse, because we can all do that. You can always find somebody worse, right? I'm not as bad as that guy or that one. As though that is the standard. So they tell themselves that there's no re- need to repent, that they're healthy, that they're, they are okay. I want to look at a couple of verses, a couple of other passages in here in Luke. We'll look at uh, Luke 5, 29 to 32, and we'll flip over to Luke 18, 9 to 14, and Luke chapter 7. But first, let's take a quick look. If you want to flip back to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. We can back up to verse 27. And we get the context. And after that, he went out and noticed a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. And he left everything behind and rose up and began to follow him. And Levi gave a big reception for him at his house. And there was a great crowd of tax collectors 
Boy, that's some fun, right? And other people who were reclining at the table with him and the Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling. Really, you can blame them. Um, at the disciples saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, It is not for those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. We know if if we've spent any amount of time with Paul at all, that the law is our schoolmaster. The law is there to show us our need for a redeemer. The law is never intended to be kept perfectly as a means of our own righteousness to get into heaven. The law was never intended for that. The Pharisees either didn't realize that, or if they ever knew it, they forgot about it. They're too busy impressing themselves, being self-righteous, that how awesome they are. And a lot of those laws from the rabbinical law aren't even in the scripture, but they keep all those little details and they lay those burdens on other people. Again, forgetting that that's not even the intention of the law, the purpose of the law. Flip, flip over, if you will, to Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. I hope I'm going someplace with this, and I know you hope I am too. And I am. Luke 18, verses 9 to 14, and he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one Pharisee, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying these things to himself. I think that's significant. He's praying to himself, not praying to God. Maybe he is his own God, right? God, I thank you that I am not like other people, <clears throat> swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his chest, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Now, this is kind of a euphemism here when it talks about lifting your eyes to heaven. It's particularly in in Hebrew culture, when you're talking about lifting your eyes to heaven or praying to heaven, who lives there? So it's a euphemism for God. So he didn't want to lift his eyes up to God because in his humility, he says, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. One of my favorite passages is in Luke chapter 7. It feel, go back in the other direction a couple chapters. Luke chapter 7, we'll pick up in verse 36. Now, one of the Pharisees was asking him to, to eat with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, there was a woman in the city who was a sinner, and when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And standing behind him at his feet crying, she began to wet his feet with her tears. And she kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet repeatedly is the tense here in the original language and anointing them with perfume. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, well, if this man were a prophet, he'd know who and what sort of woman this was, who's touching him. She's a sinner. That doesn't say what 
her sin was. We know the kinds of sin that were pretty common back in the day and probably pretty common today. So Jesus answered and said to him in verse 40, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, Say it, teacher. This is a money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And they were, when they were unable to pay, repay, he graciously forgave them. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, Well, I suppose the one whom he graciously forgave more. And he said to him, You've judged correctly. And turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she wet my, my feet with her feet. Let me try that again. She wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason, I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little, because he thinks he doesn't need much forgiveness, right? Then in verse 48, then he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. And those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So why? Why? Faith? Why did her faith save her? Faith in what or faith in whom? How did that save her from her sins? We know the answer to that. Because her faith is in the one who is, has the power to forgive sins. He had not even gone to the cross yet. She probably had no clue how that was going to work, but she just knew that he came with words of authority and words of, of power. So back in Luke 15, if you want to flip back to Luke 15, verses 8 to 10, what we'll see is the story of, of, the, of the woman who lost a coin. Or what woman, if she has 10 drachmas and loses one drachma, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. And when she's found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the drachma which I have lost. And you're probably asking yourself, what's the big deal about losing a coin? I lose them all the time. You know, I might even fish something out of my pocket. There goes a quarter, it rolls under the bed or under the sofa or whatever. What's the big deal about a drachma? Well, a drachma was about a day's wages. So that's one thing. It's not insignificant, not real easy for a lot of women to lay their hands on. Women weren't exactly down at the local factory or the local a and PM working all the time. So it was significant, but there's more than that. Um, married women often use these in a 10-piece a, a necklace. So it has marital significance. So uh, think of your engagement ring. If you ladies will think about your engagement ring, how bereft you might be at, you set it somewhere, you put it by the sink, you set it on the counter somewhere, and you're looking for it and it's gone, it's missing, and you just, you know, you're beside yourself, you don't know what you did with your, your engagement ring. So that's the significance here of, of the, this coin, the reason why it meant so much. So you lose it someplace in the house, you're going to turn everything over, you're going to toss the cushions. You're going to conscript the kids to help you find it. You're going to do everything you can to try to find this engagement ring. Well, she was missing that coin. It was something that meant much to her. So the shepherd, or the sheep owner, lost 1%. This woman, she lost 10%. 
of the coins she had on this necklace. And then we look at the, the two sons and, and verses uh, 11 to 32. You could also call this more than the story, the story or the parable of the prodigal son. You can call this the parable of the loving father, the story of the loving father. It's more about the father than it is about the son. And that's why we're here today talking about this as opposed to a sermon in a Father's Day sermon where you pull one of the patriarchs out of the scripture and talk about what an awesome example it is and you guys don't live up to it. So instead what we're doing is we're looking at an example that none of us can live up to, right? None of us can live up to this example. But it's important to see the father, the way he presents himself. Now we say the way he presents himself because you you're thinking, well, Jesus has given these parables, you know. You tend to think Jesus isn't the Father, but really, if you look, if you look at John 14, and you can turn there or not, I'm, I'll just read it. But John, John 14, Jesus talking to his disciples, he says, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And in verse 7, he says, if you have come to know me, you will know my Father. From now on, you know him and have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. And it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you all so long? And have you not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, do not, I do not speak from myself, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I am the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also and greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And then he caps it off by saying, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So now at this point, you were saying, well, wait, Dave, I thought you were just saying a moment ago, and talking about the Pharisees, and they were all wrapped up in trying to keep the commandments. And yet Jesus says this, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And the answer to that is simply we know we cannot keep the letter of the law. This is the whole intention, the whole purpose of Christ, God coming down in the form of a man, to live a perfect life that we cannot live. So he lived a substitutionary life. We talk much about his substitutionary death on the cross. We don't always talk about his substitutionary life, but did he not live a perfect life on our behalf? Because we cannot. So Christ lives a substitutionary life for us, lives the perfect life that we cannot. And then he died on the cross for our sins, paid for the sins that we commit and the sins because of the things that we do not do, that we're supposed to be doing. So how does that work? Well, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's why we keep the law as best we can. We, Paul in Romans 6 and 7 didn't he describe about his struggles with the law and keeping the law? And it's impossible. And then the things he doesn't want to do are the things he ends up doing. And the things he doesn't, you know, that he does want to do, he can't seem to do. This is a struggle. We know we're not going to get it perfectly, but because if we love the Lord, it's going to be 
revealed in our lives by us trying to follow him. And there should be fruit in our lives trying to follow him. So this is what love looks like. Because if you love somebody, you want to try to please them, right? Also, if you want, if you want a picture of God, people will paint pictures, paint portraits of God. People will try to paint portraits of Jesus. Sometimes they'll have the golden hair and the blue eyes and long flowing hair and beard and whatever. These aren't, we know these aren't accurate, but if you want a picture to hang on your wall of God, write down or print up the Ten Commandments and hang them on a wall. That's God. That's his character. That's his nature. That's what he wants you to know. That's why he wants you to wear it on the frontlets and put it on the door posts and paint it on the walls. Because if we love God, we're going to try to live in a way that's pleasing to him. So now, the parable of the lost drachma, in the same way, as I tell you, in, in, in back in Luke 15, verse 10, I tell you there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. You think God knows that we can't keep his law? You think God realizes that that's part of the plan of redemption that he established before the foundations of the world to begin with? Not that that lets us off the hook for, oh, well, God knew, so he should be good with it, because no. It's where the repentant heart is, the self-righteous. Look at the the Pharisees and the tax collectors again, and they're trying to keep the letter of the law, and they can't keep it, but where is their love for God in that? Are they doing it by rote? Are they trying to do it by rote so they're happy with themselves and makes them pleased with themselves? Or are they trying to do it because it would please God and make him happy? So this is a gut check. This is where we check our hearts. We should do that regularly, right? So now we get into the, the parable of the lost sons or the story of the loving father, if you will. Verse 11 says, A man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. So here we got a 50-50 deal. Now we got, we're going to have where 50% of his sons is lost. We had 1% of the sheep, we had 10% of the drachmas, and now we got 50% of the sons. So the younger son, he's obviously he's impetuous. You know, you usually get your inheritance when Pops dies, right? He didn't even want to wait for his dad to die. Where was his love there? It's like, man, this guy's, I got life to live. I got things to do. I got a yacht I want to buy, whatever it is. You know, he just, hey, can you just go ahead and give me your, give me my inheritance now? It kind of sends dad a, discourteous message, right? Well, and here's the thing too. Your inheritance is going to come out of whatever goods, your home, your properties. Things probably have to be sold off so that you can get that inheritance. The, the way this worked is the oldest son would get two-thirds and whatever was left might be divided among the others. So he had two sons, so he wanted his one-third. So even if he didn't sell everything off, his dad had to sell off a significant amount they had to tally, calculate, and figure out how much it was that he'd be owed to give it to him. And so the son just kind of says, bye, Dad, and takes off to make his way in the world. So how did this, how did this work out? Verse 13 says, and not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together, and went on a journey in a distant country, and there he squandered his estate, living recklessly. Prodigal living is where you get the prodigal son, the sense from the Greek to the debauched lifestyle. So he lived a life of debauchery. So it wasn't like he went and invested all of his money in, in uh, Google or Yahoo or whatever, and he blew it and it didn't do well. 
much back then. It probably wouldn't do well. But it was debauched living. He was reckless with his money, and he squandered everything. Verse 14, now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be impoverished. Uh Uh-oh. So here he found himself away from home. He blew his money. No doubt his friends all vanished when his money dried up, right? Because that's the way it works. And now, I don't think that God reacted to this young man's poor choices. Um, God knew where this was headed, as we said before, before the foundation of the world. God, God does not learn. Can I say that? God doesn't learn. God didn't say, oy vey, what am I going to do? Okay, all right, let me do this. This was all a planned deal, and I'm sure this famine didn't affect just this son. It affected many people, and that's the way God's plans work. Works good over here. Works some rough stuff on other people over here. It might be judgments for some people down the center line. Who knows? God's got his purposes, but this life, this son's life lesson, you know, we know the Lord... Who the Lord loves, he chastens or spanks. So God had this set up for a purpose, and he knew that this would all work out to a point in this young man's life where he could learn some really some really tough, valuable life lessons. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country And he sent him into his his fields to feed swine. Now imagine being a Jew and having to feed swine. Now this was a curse. This was a curse for the the um, Jewish people back in the day. They would say, you know, may you be have to live with the swine or something like that. Those kinds of things. You know, may you get what. What's coming to you dwelling with the swines? It's an unclean animal. It's it's the worst of them. Feeding the pigs. Now, how do we know he's a Jew? Well, look at the context. um, Verses 1 and 2, Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming to hear him to listen, and both the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling. Who's the audience? The scribes and the Pharisees. So Jesus is coming up with a story that's going to be the worst and the best possible examples for the Pharisees and the scribes. So things become really desperate. In verse 16, he says, uh, and he was desiring to be fed with the pods. These were carob pods that the swine were eating and no one was giving him anything. No one was giving anything to him at all. So, you know, he's in desperate straits when he's considering, he's looking at the Purina pig chow and he's thinking that looks pretty good right about now. That's a desperate situation. And no one was giving him anything. Why wasn't anybody giving him anything? You can feed the pigs, you can't feed him. Well, a pig you can eat and you can eat over a few days. People aren't going to eat a human, you know, well. Maybe in some parts of the world, maybe some parts over there, but evidently in this country over here, they weren't going to do that. So nobody's giving him anything to eat. So he was at this point was so hungry, he wanted to eat with the pigs. But look what happened. Verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I'm here dying with hunger. I will rise up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. So he knew that he sinned against God. He he broke the rules. He asked his father to break the rules so that he can have his share. He had very little consideration or thought for his father. And he took off because he wanted to live his own life, make his own way. And he squandered everything, squandered his 
his dad worked how many years for that one third of all that his dad had that he sold off for him? Well, that's a significant, no matter what your position. I, I don't care if, uh, you know, you're the guy who works down at, uh, you know, the local restaurant and you're a dishwasher, which is considered a low paying job. If you did that for a number of years, 30 years, let's say you had a 30 year retirement. They had a nice plan there, right? 10 years of the father's life that was wiped out over as many days by this younger son. Now he's, he's uh, thrown away all this hard work from his father over the years. Crazy. So he says, uh, verse 19, he says, I'm no longer to be called your son. He says, I'll rise up to my, go to my father. We'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. Verse 19, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. You don't even have to call me a son anymore. I'll just, I'll just work for you. I just, I need to eat and I'll just work for you. I've blown it. I'm no longer worth much. That's what worthy means. I'm no longer worth being called your son. So he recognizes his sin. And this is how regeneration works, isn't it? In, in verse 14, you know, look at this in verse 14. This is how it should work anyway. In um, verse 14, we have the big uh-oh. In verse 15, he comes up with his own solution, his man-made solution, and this job doesn't work out very well. He ends up feeding swine. Verse 16 and 17, he realizes his condition is worsening, and he's dying of hunger. Verse 18, I'll rise up and go to my father, and we'll say to him, Father, I sinned against heaven and before you, and he recognizes his falling short is because of sin. So he knows, he's recognizing his need to return to the Father is not, well, because I'm hungry. Let me make up a nice story or something, maybe say I was robbed. He could have done that. If he was lying and he wasn't honest about it, he could have said, I am. Dad, I got mugged. I'll make up this story. Dad, I got mugged. Everything was robbed from me. No, he recognizes that it's sin. Verse 19, he says, I'm no longer even worth being called your son. Just make me one of your hired men. This is what he wants to do. And he clearly sees himself through God's eyes, and he's humbled. Verse 20, so he gets up, and he came to his father. It doesn't say he returned home, that he went back home. He returns to his father. He's thinking of returning to his father. And I just, I'm going to go home with my tail between my legs. Maybe I can get my brother to make me a sandwich. Well, while he was still a long way off, what happened? His father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. So he's repentant. He returns to his father and he's embraced. And this is what it looks like. This is what God does. And our heavenly father knows we're returning. And he knows that we're sinning. So his father, from a long way off, sees him, feels compassion for him. He doesn't even get a chance to get to his father and say anything to him. And his father knows what happened and sees him. He's a mess. And he runs all the way down and he falls on him. He embraces him and he keeps on kissing him repeatedly. But his son's rehearsing this, right? He's been rehearsing this. Okay, let me, can I say it this way? Whatever. He's been rehearsing this thing all the way home. And I, that had to have been a long walk. So in verse 21, the son says to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and before you I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father's already on him, embracing him and kissing him. So the son is saying this by rote because he's practiced it and it's so well rehearsed. So he's expressing his contrition. And I think that's important. We repent. We need to express our contrition and say, Father, I've sinned against you. You know, forgive me. Then verse 22, but the father said to his slaves, he's quickly, 
bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand and sandal on his feet and bring the fatted calf, slaughter it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found and they began to celebrate. So he's forgiven. He's brought back into the fold with open arms. A lost son has been found like all who are God's children and who would come to him. So bringing out the best robe, this is a, a family thing. We're in the family robe, the family clothes. This is showing that he's embraced and brought back to the family. So they put it on him. They put a ring on his hand, It'd be like the signet ring. It's, it's a symbol of authority. You know, you write legal documents and you, you've heard of putting a seal on things. And the Lord one day will open up the seven seals in heaven and retake heaven and earth. And this signet ring would be what you'd put on a wax seal on a legal document so you can speak for your family on behalf of your family, on behalf of your father, as if you're him. So that's as far as his father went. And he also said, and sandals on his feet. The slaves, very often, most often, were barefoot. They didn't even wear shoes. They didn't wear sandals. So he's telling his son, you're not going to be my slave. You're going to be my son. So he brought him in fully and completely that way. So this is how regeneration works. We have that uh-oh moment. We realize we're caught in our sin and we see the consequences of our sin falling in on us and this can happen to us not just in our initial redemption when we're converted but this can happen often in life where we find ourselves in a deep mess and we realize how deep in we are and we're falling short of the glory of God and we're in sin and so we Come to him humbled and repent, and he embraces us. This is a picture of your heavenly father. Notice his father was not up there going, oh, look what the cat dragged in. Look who's coming back now. Of course, I should have known this was going to happen. No, look at the love of the father. And this is your heavenly father. Well, we're not done there, of course. As awesome as a Father's Day this was for this father. And we pick up in verse 25 and we close out the chapter with his older son. His older son in, in verse 25 was in the field and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he's summoning one of the servants. He began inquiring what these, what these things could be. What's, what's going on? What's this about? Why, what's with the party? Verse 27, he said to him, your brother's come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he's received him back safe and sound. Good news, right? No, the older son became angry in verse 28 and was not wanted to go in, sulking. Not wanted to go in, and his father came out and began pleading with him. Come on in. He was lost. Now he's found. Your brother's back. And he answered and said to his father, look. Now speak, speaking of which, keep in mind here, he's speaking to the scribes and Pharisees, the self-righteous. Look, for so many years, I have been serving you right here at this temple all the time, learning all these little laws. I've never neglected a command of yours and yet never have you given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who's devoured your wealth with prostitutes, which we don't know that that's where it went, but you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, child, and this too is your father, right? You're always with me, and all that is mine is yours. And we had to celebrate and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and is alive and was lost 
and has been found. So, of course, we get here and we say, well, wow, which one is really the lost son, right? So the older son is envious of his younger brother. He's the rule keeper. He's self-righteous. He never does anything wrong, or at least is better than this brother. So he sulks and feels like he's owed something. How dare he? This is works righteousness. This is self-righteousness. Because he never knew that he was a sinner. He never knew that he was sick. Never realized he was sick. Now, some will say, the old, well, you know, the older son was not saved. Well, I've got to remember in the storyline here, we don't know how this is going to end up. And that's not the point of, of the lesson. The son is his. Um, God knows who's his and who's aren't. And I will say that God knows each and every one of us um, and loves us until we get to the point in our life, which is our death, when it's final and we have not repented. So who's, who's lost sheep were in verse 4? And, and who's, who lost the coin? It was hers. You had the owner, the shepherd, the sheep owner. If the woman owned the coin, it was hers. And these sons are the father's sons, and he calls them both his sons. But we can be legalistic sometimes, can't we? We can be really far too often pleased with ourselves, and we compare ourselves to each other. We can do this even in church. And while here he was addressing the scribes and the Pharisees and looking at legalism, which is a big issue at that particular time, because they look down on everybody. They look down on this sinner and that sinner and this tax collector and and everybody was beneath them. Well, in, in modern Western world and church today, a lot of times too, the people who are self-righteous can often be people who don't go to church, right? And I'm not going to go to church. The church is full of hypocrites. So it can be that way too. So self-righteous can... can Fill the temple, fill the church. The self-righteous can fill the streets and scorn the people in church. The self-righteous can be you and I at any time in our lives. We look askance at somebody else and feel like we're better than them about anything. So we don't know that how this ends up with the son, and the story doesn't end. Like I say, God will call us a son until it's too late to call us son. In uh, Psalm 711, God is angry with the wicked every day. Yet for his sons, how does God look at them? As believers, we can resent others. We also can wander and the shepherd has to hobble us within the flock. So for those who need to repent or think they don't, we need to humbly seek the Father and make his day. Reconcile, Father, while it is still today. So this Father's Day I told you this might be rough on all of us, whether men or women. But I want us to have the right perspective here as Jesus gives it on who the Father is and how far his love extends. Before this son could even get the words out of his mouth, the Father was on him, hugging him and kissing him. So whatever garbage you might have going on in your life right now, the Father's ready to receive you before you even make your way down the path to return to him, he's ready to receive you with open arms. And if the Father, if the Heavenly Father, this is possibly more important, or at least as important, according to the lesson that he's giving here for the scribes and Pharisees, if the Heavenly Father is that welcoming to the sinner, who are we to say that I'm not going to welcome that person? We are saying that we're better than God. Oops, we need to welcome each other. We need to welcome and be gentle with the sinners on the street, share Christ with them, and we really need to with the family of God as well. 
So that is happy Father's Day for our Heavenly Father. How he sees us and the things that we do in our lives in repentance that makes his day, makes our Heavenly Father happy to see us coming back to him. Let's pray. God, we're so thankful that you've worked out this plan of redemption for all of us before the foundation of the world. That your love could extend to us to such a degree that you would see what we're capable of, this wickedness in this world that we are so capable of and we do every day. And yet you decided to go ahead and go through with your plans and not scrap them. God, thank you that in our repentance, you are there ready and quick to receive us with open arms and to embrace us. Lord, help us to reciprocate, to love you back, even before we get to that state. Help us to keep your commandments, not that we're going to do it perfectly, God, as you know better than we do, but, but God, because we want to please you, we want to make you happy, we want you to be glorified in our lives. We want to do what is pleasing in your sight, and we pray that your Holy Spirit would work out great fruit in our lives for your sake and for your glory. Help us to love one another. These are the commandments. And Father, we ask that you would bless the rest of this week, that you bring us back next week, help us to enjoy the rest of our day, realizing that we are resting the arms of a loving Father for all eternity. For it's in Christ's name we pray, and we give you thanks. Amen. Jason has...